Welcome and thank you for tuning in to this evening's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, which is our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Cindy, your host, and we are excited to be presenting How Stories Connect Us, Richard Van Camp and Friends, a discussion of the storyteller's role in community and society and the power of the art form. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, as known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with the final claim settlement in 2010. Word on the Street Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Heron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Word on the Street Toronto operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tuckeronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step with long histories. Um, this is the only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. Just a few announcements before we introduce tonight's panelists. Uh, firstly, unfortunately, Joshua Whitehead will not be able to join us this evening due to unexpected personal circumstances. We are sending our well wishes to him. Um, earlier, I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32-year history. Uh, but that's not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores starting this weekend. We'll be at Baca Phoenix Books on Saturday and another story bookshop on Sunday. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see signing schedules for both shops. Don't forget to sign up for upcoming panels. This is the first panel of our first day of our 10-day festival, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Last night, we had Cadence Wepping joining us to help kick off the festival with a discussion of his newest album, Parallel Worlds, as part of our City Imagine series. Later tonight, we will be joined by Liz Howard to chat about her newest release, Letters in a Bruised Cosmos, with Sarah Yimei Tiang. All information about upcoming panels can be found on our website, which is toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from the Word on the Street Toronto, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoy today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. And now I am pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Billy Ray Belcourt. Billy Ray Belcourt, who goes by he, him pronouns, is a writer and scholar from the Driftpile Cree Nation. He won the 2018 Griffin Poetry Prize for his debut collection, The Wound is a World, which was also a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. His second book of poetry, Andy and Coping Mechanisms, Notes from the Field, was long listed for Canada Reads 2020. He is a recipient of the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship and the Inspire Award. Belcourt is an assistant professor of Indigenous Creative Writing at UBC. Over to you, Billy Ray. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Also, hello, Cindy. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be the moderator for this celebration of three really fantastic writers. Our first writer is Richard Van Camp, a proud Pacho Denny Dene from Fort Smith, North Dakota Territories. He's the author of 26 books, which were released over 26 years. You can visit uh, with Richard on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at richardvancamp.com. Lisa Bird Wilson is a Saskatchewan Métis and Nehia writer. Her fiction book, Just Pretending, won for Saskatchewan Book Awards, was shortlisted for the Danuta Gleed Award, and was a 2019 One Book, One Province selection. Her debut poetry collection, The Red Files, is inspired by family and archival sources and reflects on the legacy of the residential school system and the fragmentation of families and histories. She's the chair of the Saskatchewan and to, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna mispronounce that, uh, a writer circle in uh, Saskatchewan, the group that hosts uh, an Indigenous Literature Festival 
and she's the CEO of the Gabriel Dumont Institute of Native Studies and Applied Research in Saskatoon, and the author of um, Probably Ruby. Keller Pennock was adopted from a Korean Métis family around the Lesser Slave Lake area of Alberta. He's a graduate of Guelph University's Creative Writing MFA program. He currently lives in Toronto, where he has worked as an educator and community worker for over 10 years. Bones is his first book. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I believe perhaps we can begin with a reading from Richard. Oh, wonderful. Well, Musty Cho, Billy Ray, Musty Cho, Tyler, Musty Cho, Lisa. I want to say a don't a don't a sagya masi, my friends. It's so lovely to be with you this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Richard Van Camp. I'm Plecho Denny from Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, Treaty 8 Country. And I live in Edmonton with my family on Treaty 6 Country. I am so grateful again to you all for joining us. And rather than read from Gather, uh, this is my new book with the University of Regina Press. It's about storytelling. Um, you can actually go uh, to Richard Van Camp on SoundCloud, and you can go to Richard Van Camp on YouTube. And I've spent the pandemic actually uploading and converting a lot of the elder stories that are in this book into the original audio files, but I've digitized them. So I just want to talk about that. So my new book, Gather, is really about miracle stories. And I always say we're all children in the great mystery together. And I always think how the universe has scattered us across this beautiful planet of ours, but it's stories that unite us. It's stories that remind us about what it means to be human. So Gather is really about Thompson Highway sharing a story about him falling over uh, a railing after a huge performance. And he knew he was going to land on his neck. This was going to be a, a life-altering fall, but he was actually caught by four angels. And one of them was his late brother who put him down gently. That, we open with that story. And I've been able to be in the right place at the right time. It seems my whole life to be in the presence of great storytellers like Glenn Douglas, who was an Okanagan elder, one of the most decorated indigenous veterans of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And he shared with me a story in 1992 about being hit with a concussion grenade in the Korean War that killed him. And he saw the other side. So if you go to Richard Van Camp's SoundCloud after this or whenever you want, you can actually hear Glenn share the entire story about what it was like in that, in that horrible battle that cost him his life and seeing the other side and coming back to talk about it. I also interviewed Maria Brown, who was a beautiful Chippewan elder from Fort Smith. And I interviewed her probably in 1991 when I was the handy bus driver. And she told me about passing away in her sleep and seeing the other side. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, if you'll remember March, April, May, um, when we were really terrified about what exactly are we dealing with here globally and locally and nationally, I found the old tapes, those little tiny, tiny micro cassette tapes, and I, I found a way to digitize them. And I've uploaded them for everybody with permission from the families. So if you want to hear wonderful elders, indigenous elders, two elders, specifically Maria Brown and Glenn Douglas, talking about seeing the other side, those audio files are there just waiting for you to listen to them. And I also interviewed Anna Tenasket, who when she was a young lady, she was in Vernon, British Columbia. And uh, she was about to be apprehended by several men who were drinking. She was babysitting all by herself. She was a teenager, but it was the little people who saved her. It was the little people who saved her. And so I found this little micro cassette and I digitized it and I got in touch with her and I said, Anna, remember that story you told me about the little people? She said, oh, yes. I said, I found that tape. Can I digitize it and put it on SoundCloud for people to listen to? Because I think it's going to give a lot of people a lot of hope. She said, you found that tape. My goodness, when, when you interviewed me in 1992, I was a mom. She says, I'm a, I'm a grandmother now. I think my, my grandkids would like to hear that. So, so Gather is about community. It's about storytelling. It's about the power of stories. And uh, I'm really, really proud of the collection. I'm really proud to 
to have interviewed so many wonderful elders. And I invite you all to listen to the audio files on SoundCloud. If you go Richard Van Camp, they'll be there for free. And if you go to Richard Van Camp YouTube, I have a channel. I'm uploading, uploading a lot of old videos that I took and a lot of drum dances and love songs that Mr. John Gone took in 1993. I tracked him down. I found a whole pile of his CDs. And I got his permission to digitize him because he's retired now. And so what I'm finding is that the greatest joy of my life is being able to gather medicines for others and gather medicines for my family, whether it's a love song or a new recipe or a beautiful story, a beautiful miracle story, anything that I can do to help others, that's how I want to be remembered. Masi Cho, thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope you enjoy watching uh, the videos that we've been converting and listening to the audio files we've been digitizing. This pandemic sure slowed us down, but I knew that all storms pass, and we're going to get through this one day at a time. So why not use this time to gather the family medicines that you need so you come out of this stronger, humbler, and more grateful for all that you have. Masi Cho, thank you. Thanks, Richard. I believe now, uh, Lisa. Well, Tanse, good day, good evening. Um, I am in Saskatoon, Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis Nation. And um, thank you, Richard, for those words. Uh, you're always so inspiring to listen to and so, um, you know, so enthusiastic about writing and about Indigenous literature and about our stories. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a new book, probably Ruby, something's going on here, uh, <laughs> just out from Doubleday Canada. And uh, probably Ruby is about the character Ruby. Ruby is adopted and Indigenous and sort of at a, at a high level, the story is very much about how Ruby spends her entire life trying to find her way back home. Uh, so I just have a little bit that I'm going to read uh, from the book, just not very long. But I wanted to start with the um, the quote that I have at the beginning of the book from Anne Scott Momaday. So when I'm thinking about us talking here today about stories, I found this really, really relevant. And I find it really relevant in my own writing. So um, this is from Anne Scott Momaday. We are what we imagine. Our very existence consists in our imagination of ourselves. Our, our best destiny is to imagine, at least completely, who and what and that we are. The greatest tragedy that can befall us is to go unimagined. And I'm going to just read uh, a, a small amount from uh the chapter called bros and this is this is ruby uh meeting her family and meeting her cook for the first time and it really speaks to that significance of finding you know who we are where we come from finding out who you're related to that's really that's really important to uh as an indigenous adoptee myself i understand the importance of that and so ruby i'll just set this up a little bit ruby through her through her life, she um, has missed family. She's missed having family and understanding where she's come from. And then she has her kids, her boys, and she realizes that they too are going to miss this. So she fabricates, um, before she understands and knows where she's from, she fabricates uh, these family pictures for her kids. So she has pictures that she hangs on the walls and she goes around and she tells the kids, that's your cousin, that's your auntie, that's your mushroom, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, this will sort of make maybe make reference to family pictures. So I wanted to, to make that clear. The first time Ruby met Rose and Gordy, they brought a shoebox full of photographs. She had only ever seen one picture of Leon mailed to her by Rose months before they met. Ruby would always remember taking that first photo out of the envelope as if Leon was being born. In the course of their three days together on that first meeting, Ruby examined dozens of pictures over and over. She never tired of it, and Rose and Gordy indulged her. She scrutinized each photo, inspected Leon's features, 
Do you think we have the same nose? She asked more than once, holding a photo beside her face for comparison. They had already all agreed that she had Leon's eyes. A photo of Leon, standing in front of a car, the sun in his eyes, his fists clenched as if an instinctive posture, black bomber jacket and black boots, and those fists. Ruby had a photo of herself with the same fists. She was only nine or 10 years old, standing in the backyard in summer, glaring at the camera. Small, tight fists, clenched, almost ready to run. On the third day, Rose gave Ruby a large brown envelope. She'd enlarged a photo at a shop downtown, a rush job. That's your dad, she said, but Ruby already knew. Blown up to 16 by 20, the picture was of Leon as a baby, wearing a blue knit sweater and hard white baby shoes, old enough to sit up, but not old enough to walk yet. When Ruby arrived home from that inaugural weekend, the first thing she did was frame the photo carefully before taking down the one of the family pictures, a cute northern baby with a runny nose, and replace, replacing it with Leon's picture. Later, she would hang a picture of herself next to Leon. Ruby on her second birthday, wearing a dress of a similar blue, a mirror for their baby selves, compared the noses, the eyes, the eyebrows, his golden brown skin, a similar tone to hers and her boys. She thought about Gordy saying she had the same stance as Leon. He was wiry, tough, Gordy said. He didn't take any shit. Bodies are math, Ruby thought. An identity is an equation that's always true no matter what. She and her boys had inherited Leon's geometry. The boys were nothing, if not nimble, their calculations echoing to a fuzzy parallel. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, Tyler, you're up. Thanks. You ever get those moments where you you like poetry what i love about poetry and writing is sometimes you'll be writing a thing and, and doing a thing and then suddenly something comes out of you that just that feels like you know like a cloud like it just it feels like something that you yourself couldn't have thought of without the world taking part and uh every day now for the past week uh jennifer alicia said something she uh, she brought out an unattributed quote which was uh I think what it was, was we, in the end, all we've become is stories. And my immediate response to that was, I want to be a story that makes people smile. Um, so I'll read from Blood, and particularly from the edited version, which would be fun. Okay. Before dawn, everything slows like a held breath, waiting to see what survived, an embrace with change. A meeting sung in water droplets, cold leaves and branches shrinking the air around them. Beads growing like fruit, supernatural if we think the air's capacity constant and perception implies existence. Mornings are a cautious awakening where water speaks of clouds. No one wants to learn who was taken while we slept. And yet, there is always bird song, breaking the quiet, letting us know it's safe to rise again. Morning sounds, reaching westward, well ahead of the, the sun's first light, wait to cover the earth in new things. As water rushes through ice fractures led by warmth's advance, thawing space enough to peer through, fringes contorting to occupy the lens of a new medium. Receding lines cradle the cold, a distorted retreat from warming air. Ice exhales a new land with nutrient enough to grow in, but still hesitant, withholding, jealously guarding shapes, features, and structures made the night before. Dried blood, brown and graying in a, on a swab is my favorite color. Hues a mix of blood and earth clouding. The memory of red that flooded the syringe, richer than darkness, telling of a day's work. The burden of a long night binging, cradling toxic things, introduced 
but still needed in their time. There's a richness that others can't accept with all the things inside you that you'd still flow thick with debris, a host for things that society shouldn't want. Stronger for the effort it takes to remain wild and beautiful. In the face of interactions that reduce you to ash, the faded product of a spent force. But I like that, being the dust of embers, so small that we're barely seen, though our existence fuels the growth of things. I have, I have so many writing books given by loving friends that I left before they could ask what I wrote. So many blank pages, I feel like I've earned them. The way an ocean can earn fog, being colder than the body beside it. Each page wanting to hold something, but never pieces of me. A whiteness so repetitive that I'm scared to mark it. Create features the ink might contain for others to focus on. Being featureless is powerful, especially in memory. Because without a mark, at least they're still searching. Hmm. Should I survive the spring? It won't be because I'm strong. Few of us are. We're like girdled trees, hard, thirsty, and suffocating. Forests gleaming, beautiful briefly, bursting red and brown in early death. Shaped this way by governing, hegemonizing, dominating hands. Whiter, softer than bark, and yet. Small aggressions multiplied and unceasing, clot and choke the same. More efficient than knives, axes. There's no blood spray to outline a darkened killer. No sap rushing out to hold and stick. Stop the blades that released it. And this one, uh, do this one last. Cities are alive and speaking. Behave, the skyscrapers say, a threat carried in their mastery at hiding the sun. A potency suggested by their height and abundance crowding over me. Windows like breeding eyes pointed out and downward, multiplying antipathy. Like teachers, building power and authority through a classroom silence. Endorsed, encouraged by every unchallenged abuse until I'm left like these buildings, static with hundreds of holes, fixed and open. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Those are uh, wonderful readings. Um, and uh, I really do encourage folks to get their hands on these books. The first question I have for you is a short one. And it is, what to you characterizes an impactful story? Can you either be in relation to what you attempt to do as a writer or as someone who absorbs stories or who listens or reads? Mm, okay. okay, I think I'm up first. So I'll I just I think I'm gonna answer your question with something that just happened actually in our, our front yard. So you know we're we're always starving, hey, as writers, we're just so lonesome for stories, we're lonesome for community, we're lonesome for spirit. And so uh, my dear friend Ruben Martel from Waterhen, Saskatchewan, he just uh, finished directing his beautiful horror film called Don't Say Its Name. And it's uh, playing in Calgary pretty quick here. And uh, it'll, it's making it around slowly. And so his son, Nicholas, is starting film studies at U of A. And Nicholas is just starting out. He's 18, 19, uh, you know, his whole life ahead of him. He's about to discover so many good things this year. And, and I was thinking to myself, boy, you know, I'm really lonesome to spoil someone. So I said 
to him, I said, Nicholas, when you come over on Saturday with your dad and your little brother, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my closet. You know, I used to tour all the time. I've got these beautiful shirts. I mean, they're they're dry clean. They're, they're pressed. They're really nice. And I bet you're going to have to give lots of presentations this year, at, you know, online. And he says, yeah, they, they told us to dress up for our formal presentations. I said, well, I got about nine shirts. I'm going to give them to you. You strike me as a large uh, hips 36. He goes, yep. And I said, great. And I said, oh, I got some sweet grass I want to give you. And I got a bunch of samurai DVDs I'm going to give you because you're always talking about samurais. And anyways, I'll just walk around the house and I'll, I'll do a little uh, giveaway for you when I see you on Saturday. So I did that. And then I was a doorman for Bob Cardinal at the Red Willow Sweat a couple months ago. And Bob Cardinal, when, when I left, he gifted me with a shirt, a beautiful blue shirt that uh, that it would look good on anybody else but me. Blue really isn't my color. And I, and I knew, you know, George Littlechild, the great one, uh, told me, Nico Wasis told me a long time ago, Richard, you're going to be given many things on the road. And you're going to know in a heartbeat if it's for you or if you're just holding it for somebody else. And, that I, you know, for weeks I've been looking at this blue, beautiful shirt, blessed by Bob Cardinal, and I thought, one of these days I'm going to know who this is for. I don't know yet. But as I was walking around the house with all these goodies, all these beautiful shirts and sweet grass and samurai DVDs, my goodness, what else do you need after something like that? I saw that blue shirt and I thought, there you go. I'm going to give it to young Nicholas, but I'm going to mix up the shirts. and I'm going to see if he can guess which one is blessed. So I put everything together, really nice, all fancy. You know, I'm a Virgo, right? Very organized. And I go downstairs, and they're out in the yard right here, just in the front yard here in Edmonton. So there's Ruben. Ruben's on his phone talking to his Nietzsche moose. And Nicholas is to the right, and Nicholas's younger brother is to the left of his dad. And I go, all right, Nicholas. I said, here you go. Here's the most beautiful shirts. Oh, top of the line. You know, quality knows quality. I'm basically the Chandelier on two legs over here, and I'm gifting you. we got to be about nine nice shirts in there. But check this out, nephew. One of them is blessed by Bob Cardinal. And I want you to try and figure out which one it is. When you're ready, there's no rush. And I just went to go hand it to him. And Ruben didn't even look up. He said, it's the blue one. And I went, my jaw actually touched my little one chest hair. I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, Ruben, you didn't even look up. And he went, I saw it. And... To this day, I am in awe of Ruben Martel. And when you are in the presence of moments like this, that's either how you start a short story or that's how you end a short story. Or if you're Lisa Bird Wilson, you have the, 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 the majesty to end your first chapter on a moment that gold. That's the stuff we're looking for. That's how great stories are born. So I just want to raise my hands to Ruben Martel and his beautiful family and his little one on the way. And I'd also like to acknowledge that it's Terry Fox day. And I'd like to honor the, the late and great Terry Fox. You know, um, a lot of kids up and down the street all day. Like we were trying to figure out what was going on. What was the Terry Fox run? So I'd really like to acknowledge Mr. Fox, you know, eternal utmost respect. So I'm just so grateful to be here and I want to hear your answers. Musty Cho. Thank you. Should I go? I'll go next. Yes, please. That's okay. Um, okay, so I've almost forgotten the question, but I think I still have it, so I'm okay. Um, I think that it is so powerful to hear each other's stories and to find what resonates in those stories and to hear the framing and the reframing of something that... Um, that might seem familiar, but now you're able to see it in a different way. So our stories as Indigenous people and just just looking at that in a new way. And, and before we got started, Richard was talking about, you know, the the hope and the joy, you know, in the stories. And I think that that's really important. And sometimes just reading other authors and having them remind me about things like kindness and joy and hope um, is really important to me and curiosity and wonder. 
And I think when you're reading uh, somebody else's work, there is sometimes there's just one line or one or two lines that can just totally do it for me. Um, and I'll go back to that and I'll reread it because it's just hitting something, you know, right at home. And as a writer, I always hope, you know, quietly and secretly hope <laughs> that I can write one of those lines for somebody else in my work. Thank you. What about you, Tyler? You're muted. Okay, it feels if I could describe the feeling that that creates. This this is an impactful story. What we're doing now. I mean, one of my favorite things when I used to do when I was like, because I started reading Stephen King, I think at like eight or nine years old, right? So I started getting twisted early, and and then moved on to Clive Barker, and then moved on to like just anything and everything else. And the the beautiful the beautiful part of like when something created an impact, it like created. It's like planting a seed. It was something that created multiple stories out of that one moment for me. So if I had, um, oh, I can and like if I had a, if I had written a line like for example, um, I mentioned uh, how Jennifer Alicia had brought out uh, an, an, an a, a quotation from an, an an unknown author, right? And I responded to that, and that created for me a story. And there there are people. Who are watching this who are creating little stories out of that because that becomes something for them to take as their own and so like if it, if it does that even in one person creating multiple stories as they walk away from that text or that that moment or that story or that interaction also if it does that for multiple people i think that becomes something that's super impactful yeah. agreed and it makes me think of something that happened at the very first reading I participated in, in 2015, Richard was there. I was at the Art Gallery of Alberta. And I read from some of the very first poems that I ever wrote. And during the intermission, I think I had stayed behind. I was on the stage. It was an auditorium, a bunch of seats. During the intermission, one of uh, the folks in the audience approached me and she was a mom and she had a son who was very much uh, like me, so occupied a similar subject position, indigenous, queer, young, and he had passed and she hadn't really had an opportunity to get to know him in his entirety. And she thanked me for giving her something of a glimpse into the person that he was and you know we were in the audience or on the stairs just sobbing i was just sobbing <laughs> and it but it was this really powerful reminder of the um the way that a, a story or a poem can be like a hand extended out to someone else and you don't know who's going to be there to to clutch onto it and that's part of the magic and the mystery of writing i think especially for indigenous writers And perhaps um, on a similar note, so the subject of joy is one that's already come up. And it's also the subject of Richard's new book. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the ways that your characters or your poems uh, practice joy or how they grapple with joy, especially as it relates to you know, the various struggles that constitute contemporary indigenous life. Do you want me to start, Billy Ray? Sure. And I'll try and I'll try and keep it short just because I, I kind of went over my time last time. But um in in Gather, I was really lucky to to interview a lot of people who have survived the unthinkable. And I really wish I should have thought this through, but um there's a really beautiful story in here from Pauline Clark uh, from Saskatchewan. And Pauline had lost her brother in a hunting accident. And she shared this story with me at the South Bay Youth Festival 
20 years ago and it, it changed my life forever. And I, I said, I need your contact information because one day I'm going to get you to tell that story to me again. I, I have to go, but you, this, the world needs to know your story. And so the story goes that uh, she lost her, her eldest brother in a hunting accident and uh, the community erected a, a big cross out on the land where he'd lost his life to remind all the hunters to be very careful, to be mindful. And, uh, and, and that was that. And life went on, the world kept spinning. Years later, Dr. Barry Clark, who was doing, I believe, a water survey, had hired two local guides to take him out into the forest. And he was in the boat and uh, he just happened to see this big cross in the bush surrounded by, you know, poplar and alder. And, and he said, oh, what, what happened? Why, why is there a church way or a, a cross way out here? And they said, oh, uh, a really respected hunter uh, lost his life out here. And so the community and the family really wanted to honor his memory. And he just felt so compelled. He said, well, I, I've got to see this cross. And they said, sure. So they pulled up and Dr. Barry Clark went and and uh, he knelt down to see what the nameplate said. And it was his name. It was on this day. And there was the date. Barry Clark lost his life. So Dr. Barry Clark sees his own name on a cross in Saskatchewan in the middle of the forest. And he thought he died. He actually thought he died and that his guides were bringing him to the spirit world. And he ended up tumbling out of the forest and saying, what, what's happening? I don't understand what's happening. And they, they said, what do you mean? And they said, he said, well, that's my name. I, I'm Barry Clark. And they went, that's your name. You're Dr. Clark. He goes, well, I have a first name. It's Barry. That's my, why is my name on that cross? And they said, oh, Mike, we had no idea your first name was Barry. So, yes, his name was Barry Clark, and he hunted for his family, and he, everybody loved him. He was, a, our, you know, a hero. And and I don't know what to tell you. We didn't even know that you would have the same. We would never would have sent you there if we knew that, that you had the same name. And so Barry said that he went back to his, his city and his family after the survey was done, but he, he just was haunted by the loss of this great, Hunter who shared the same name. So Pauline shared the story that that one day she got a phone call from the, the postmaster in their community saying, I don't know how to tell you this, Pauline, but there's a there's a box here from your late brother. And her brother had passed been gone for quite some time. And she said, What? And she said, I don't know how to tell you this, but Barry sent you a box and it's it's here. So she went running to the post office and she got this big box and she got her whole family together and they opened it and it was a dozen roses. And they thought, my goodness, my my brother just sent us a dozen roses from the other side. They, they couldn't believe it. And so, of course, they opened it up and it was on Dalhousie University letterhead from Dr. Barry Clark. And he explained that, that you don't know who I am, but uh, I share the same name as as your your loved one who lost his life and i just i'm so devastated and heartbroken as a father that that you lost your son and if there's anything that i can do you know please accept this 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 pitiful gift and and i just i can't shake that 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 i'm supposed to to send these to you anyways long story short they adopted dr barry clark as a brother and as a friend and uh, they met, they went at the Red Lobster somewhere in Canada. There's a picture of them standing outside the Red Lobster. And uh, I think that that these miracle stories are happening all the time around us. And uh, we got Dr. Barry Clark to tell his side. We got Pauline to tell her side and we braided it. And you can actually see the letter that he sent uh, to the family with the roses. And uh, I think that the joy you're talking about, Billy Ray, is also... There's a thin line with joy and what we've learned during this pandemic is what we're all looking for with joy is hope. And I think that our miracle stories, our stories, our truth always give the people hope. Remember what they say, those who have health have everything. Wait, those who are healthy have hope and those who have hope have everything. So let's give the people everything through hope. Masicho, thank you.
Thank you, Richard. I could just um, listen to you tell stories all day. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, so in terms of just thinking about Ruby, thinking about my character and, um, you know, the way she sort of grapples with or handles joy. Uh, so Ruby, I really very much wanted to write as a contemporary um, character. I wanted to try and avoid, you know, those trauma tropes as much as possible. Um, but of course, Ruby's story is underpinned. You know, you, you learn her grandparents' story, you learn her parents' story. Uh, she herself is adopted. So, you know, underpinned by that colonial impact, that colonial violence. Um, but it, what my hope is, is that it's sort of maybe resonating in the background somehow. And, and that, you know, above that you have Ruby today, who's like just out there. She's got this big laugh. She throws it around all over the place. She's, you know, she's, um, she, and, and she's got this laugh that's kind of accomplishing a few different things, right? She's, uh, it's, it's hiding her hurt and covering things up, but it's also really, really genuine as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I was sort of thinking about this the other day and about how maybe that those pieces that are our history, right? That's our shared history of col colonialism in this country. Maybe those, I don't want them to overwhelm. I don't want them to be, you know, overshadowing um, Ruby's story, but of course they're there. And I'm hoping that for readers, maybe what they do, you know, not non-Indigenous readers is they per percolate in the background and they, you know, they just provide some awareness and that ability to 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 percolate a little bit. Um, and the other thing that you know I was thinking of was around the concept of blood memory, right? And and it's not it's not just it's not just blood memory about you know intergenerational trauma, but it's about these positive memories or blood memories about our culture and language um, and history and our ancestors. And I will never forget, I'm just gonna tell this little story from my own experience, but um, this to me embodies blood memory. The first time in my life when somebody, sorry, I'm getting all choked up. I don't think I've told this story. The first time in my life when somebody spoke to me in Cree, I understood what he said and I was raised you know, in without my language. And the fact that I knew what he was saying to me, when I look back at it now, I didn't even, I didn't know anything then. I mean, I just didn't know anything about myself um, or my culture or my language. But to me, when I look back at it now, that's blood memory. So that's all I'll say. And I'm sorry, I'm all weird and emotional. <laughs> I'll take a drink. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really touching. Thank you, Lisa. And no worries. If there's space, there's emotion. Um, and all of them are welcome. So I, I while listening, and I just love listening to all you. Have. Um, while listening to you, is I just I just got to thinking of how the process of writing has become joy. Right. So I'm. I'm an adoptee and, and I'm going to be blunt, blurt, blurted out bluntly honest. Like I am hungry for these kinds of interactions because I'm not, I didn't grow up with them. And so I, you know, you want to know the new landscape of something. And so involving myself with folks like uh, Richard, I met you a long time ago. And, and I remember that vividly um, as we we're working at a writer's gathering and, and like all of these things, but like those things stick in my memory and, and the, the interactions that I have now, actually inform the writing that I'm doing in, in, in many, many ways. So I'm, I'm editing, editing with someone that y'all may know who is warm and loving and, and, and absolutely just really, really good at, at, at fostering and building a relationship that allows you to actually grow with your words, if that makes any sense. And, and it's Joshua and you, and, and, and turning blood into something with these new edits is 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 a process that envelops joy because the the process of seeing something grow 
even though it has like from one iteration to the next, but as a result of a relationship of a friendship and, and an editor writer relationship is, is something that is beautiful because I mean, that's the whole point. No. Um, when the character in blood, their joy is their sister. Right. And their joy is their memory of of the things that they can do. But as as the book continues, their joy and their hope becomes their words. Right. And then with this whole relationship of building the second book on the first book, it's becoming like their words are becoming their joy and everything. And and they're taking joy in places where we're told not to take joy because you deserve it whether or not someone outside thinks you do based on your circumstances, right? So you'll, you'll just make it anywhere, right? So um, that's as far as I am on book two. But, but I think like the whole relationship of like not only the story, but the character and the writer and the words themselves create some kind of joy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I agree for sure. So I think we'll turn to audience questions now. Time seems to be uh, flying by. But this one is from uh, Sienna, who asks, what guides you in deciding which story to tell and at what time? Especially since there are so many stories inside all of us, how do you discern which one is needed most in a particular moment? So, you know, Musty Cho, that's the million dollar question. And I think that uh, being, I was just saying to a group today that um, they say if you want to be a better writer, you have to become a better reader. And I think there's something to that. And I think if you want to be a better storyteller, you have to become a better listener. And I'm not just talking about listening with your ears. It's listening with your heart. It's listening with your very being. It's listening with your spirit for for maybe a story that somebody needs to hear. So sometimes you you start telling stories and you have no idea why, like what happened with Billy Ray and the mother who was devastated by the loss of her son. You don't understand why you're sharing it. Out of all the poems you could have read, Billy Ray, those were the ones that she called. Those were the ones that she needed. And what you learn through storytelling is that it really is a dance between you and it's about spirit and it's about what the room needs or if somebody sometimes you don't realize the answers you're bringing to somebody and uh it's i'm always humbled by being around great storytellers um acting on instinct and uh just being there uh it it like completely present with no agenda you're just there to give you're there to help you're there to uplift i think that's the role of a good storyteller is is understanding that when when we all leave, how do I want to be remembered? What did I bring the good spirit? Did I did I bring hope? Did I up, uplift those who who have really made the time to be here? Um, I think that I always want to be remembered as somebody who who did his very best to uplift others and uh, to be a, a cheerleader, uh, to be a fun director, uh, to um, to really do do the soul work that I'm here to do. And that means gathering medicines for other people. And uh, that is the greatest joy. So I really wish you were here in person, Sienna. We could spoil you with, with stories and accolades, jokes, I tell you. And uh, we would treat you right. Everybody, I really wish you were here. I really wish my dear uncle, um, David King was here. He could cook for 20 or 200 at the drop of a hat. And he put bear grease into everything. His, his pie crusts, his bannocks, his, his pickerel fish fry. I really wish David was here. I really wish we were together under the full moon on Sunday night that's coming. And uh, we could just all sit in a circle and tell beautiful stories. Miracle stories. That would be beautiful. Maybe we could do that next year, hey? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Let's aim for that. That's a good dream, Masi Cho. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And you are a terrific cheerleader. I can attest to that for sure. Um, in terms of you know what you write, when you write it, um, I'm I'm not even you know when I finished. When I finished writing my poetry collection in 2016, I knew 
that I wanted to write, I consciously wanted to write fiction again. I knew that that's where I wanted to go with my writing and I wasn't sure what to write. Um, and I wasn't sure I had anything else to say. I thought maybe this was it. I was, I was all out. And so I just started, you know, as writers were, were told this cliche of write what you know. And, um, you know, as much as that's what it is, that's where I started. And I just started writing down little stories, little anecdotes, little bits and pieces about being Indigenous and being adopted and trying to examine it from all of these different kinds of angles. Um, and then it sort of became apparent to me that I was writing about one <clears throat> one character. And then that was Ruby. And then, you know, it just it just kind of snowballed from there. And I was writing about Ruby and I was writing about Ruby's family. So <clears throat> I ended up with this, you know, interconnected kind of a web surrounding Ruby. Uh, but I don't know, you know, there was a conscious piece at the beginning of that. And then it just it takes on a life of its own. So, I mean, that became the story um, that I wrote that became this book. So yeah, I just, I'm, and, and I don't know what made me go from, you know, nonfiction to fiction, to poetry, <laughs> to fiction. So just all over the place. And so part of it is, part of it is inspiration. Part of it is just where you're at. And part of it is just really happy accident. And I also appreciate, um, Richard, you were mentioning reading. That is, such a serious source of inspiration for any writer. Um, and so that piece is really critical as well in my practice. Oh, I can. Um, I, I don't have a heck of a lot to say about this, only to say that I have been the sort of person who will gather a bunch of poems uh, to go to a reading and then seeing and, and interacting with the people in the room, throw all of those out and pick new ones. Um, and, and that is kind of a humbling thing where you, you do, you definitely need to be aware of the room. I, and I don't mean like reading the room. I mean, you need to be in a relationship with the people that you're doing it with. And that's just me being naive about it, maybe, but it, it, it says something. It, it also keeps me not having a huge head that can float my body out of the room i think it means like literally be like to to be prepared to be, to have everything that you are walking into the room taken away so that you can be someone in and a part of the room if that makes any sense so I, i'm never really um settled on on poems weeks in advance right i'll just change it all two minutes before um as i get my water but yeah don't know if that helped that is yeah thank you yeah. And there's a question from Sarah, and I'm going to uh, rephrase it a little because it, there, it's similar to a question that I had prepared myself but didn't ask, which is about um, the negotiation of, I think, hope and difficult truth in our stories and our work and our writing. I think of something that uh, Jay Simpson said in a podcast that as a, as a spoken word poet, their mantra was that if they were going to bring an audience to hell, so to speak, that they would bring them back, that they wouldn't leave them there. And so uh, do you have anything to say about, I guess in a way, taking care of yourself, your characters, your audience? Well, I, I had an epiphany um, quite some time ago. So. My first novel, The Lesser Blessed, came out in 1996. It's, it's a movie with first-generation films. You can watch it tonight for free on CBC Gems. It's on, uh, to my surprise, I just saw it. It's on, uh, it's on Amazon Movies. Very proud to have it on there. Um, so a little while ago, I was working on a book uh, for the Journey Forward series with McKellar and Martin. And it's a, a beautiful little novella called When We Play Our Drums, They Sing. And the main character is Dene Cho. And he's going up against the principal because Dene Cho was not happy with what is not being taught in the classroom. 
And if you flip the book, you see the great Bonique Gray Smith has written an accompanying novella called Lucy and Lola. And the, this book, these books explore reconciliation. And Monique and I were racing to, to write the, the deepest, most vulnerable stories that we could. And I realized when I was about ready to hit send that I'd already done the bad teacher story. I did it in The Lesser Blessed. It's published, you know, 1996 with Douglas McIntyre. There's Mr. Harris, right, who doesn't give Larry a chance. And I realized that I could hit send and we could go to press and, and I would be happy. But as somebody who is really devoted to my craft and as somebody who really, or at least it calls my practice, I realized I would be doing the story a disservice because I've already done that. And so I decided to have something happen in the novella where the principal has world's greatest dad on a mug and Dene Cho has lost his father. And to my surprise, Dene Cho breaks down crying in the principal's office. And these two have been enemies for the last couple of years, Dene Cho and the principal. And this was the moment where the principal realizes that underneath all this rage is, is hurt and lonely and grief. And that's when the principal takes Dene Cho in a really gentle way under his wing and says, take three days off and you come back with the elders and the knowledge keepers you keep talking about. And they can give a presentation to the, to the teachers. I'll be there. It'll be a safe place. We'll get food for everybody. And I want to hear from you and from the people you believe in, Dene Cho, you tell us what we should be teaching and we'll do our best to accompany that because you're right. We, we, we're getting our curriculum from Alberta and, and from Yellowknife and you're not happy and I want you, you deserve to be happy. So, so not only did the story blossom, but myself as, as a writer, I, I really am really proud of that, that book because the opportunity arose to not do the same story twice to to investigate it in a new way and uplift both the principal and uplift you know Dene Cho because if it wasn't for our teachers many of us wouldn't be here as writers right I'm, I'm so lucky to have had the teachers and the instructors and the mentors that I've had and I really wanted to honor the teachers out there who realize that underneath the board student or the class clown is really a, a leader in waiting they they are the uh, the sacred clowns in the classroom can see right through you your curriculum and sometimes that can be a threat or it can be an opportunity so i just leave it at that musi cho for listening thank you thanks richard and um thanks for this story uh i think i think it was sarah and uh and billy ray um you know, one of the things that I think that telling our stories does, if it's fiction, if it's nonfiction, if it's poetry, whatever it is, it helps, for me anyways, it helps me to um, expose sort of the colonial myths behind my own story. So, for example, um, the colonial story of Indigenous adoption is, you know, the myth of the disadvantaged child <laughs> finding a loving, insecure home, right? And so it's the the opportunity to, um, you know, to expose those myths even for yourself, right? Um, and and sort of coming, bringing to surface. Um, these other ideas and these other creative pieces. And I think that there's such a power in the telling and the reframing. Um, so for me, that's part of where that, that balances out, you know, what you were talking about, um, Billy Ray, with the, you know, the, I wrote it down here, the, the trauma and the, and the joy or, or, you know, however we're framing that. But I, I think that that's, um, definitely a part of it is just being able to reframe it for yourself and and pick away at it and and looking at it you know as deeply as possible and reading other people who have also um 
written things that are along your frame of reference and help to inform, you know, how it is that you now are going to frame your own story. Thank you. Uh, I can answer. Um, how much do you, I'm not sure that I would consciously balance um, uplifting stuff, but but much of it comes unconsciously. Mm -hmm. in, in the beginning of the first book, I promised to look at the bad stuff as closely as possible, right? And then out of that, and I hadn't even completed the book when I was halfway through the book when I decided that this person's joy was their sister. Do you know what I mean? And then later on, the, the joy became how they saw things and the community that, that was created even just in their imaginings. And then the second book has become not only, like the second book, I'm gonna reveal. <laughs> so the second book starts as a call to several poems singing to each other as though they are not, a, as though they are alone, right? But the beauty of them singing to each other is they become a chorus of something that creates change. So I don't know if I consciously do it, but I'm always look. I feel that if you look deeply enough within trauma, you find the joy that can be made or grown out of it. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you know, like if the drama, trauma were a forest, the joy is the lake inside of it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's a lovely image. And um, I, I don't know how many, I think we're done. <laughs> we're time. <laughs> um, uh, thank you all for your really thoughtful and and heartfelt contributions tonight and i'm sure that many will will take away you know a bit of something um and that will and that will uplift them as well thanks everybody musty cho have a wonderful night and get out there and celebrate the full moon on the 20th Wait. musty cho thank you thank you thank you thanks thank everybody you. Great bless conversation. you all bless your families thank you for your wonderful stories your great energy Bless your beautiful spirits. Remember, all storms pass. We're going to get through this storm one day at a time. Crank those tunes. Read those books. Crank Raven FM 89.3 Indigenous Radio here in Edmonton. <laughs> you want to hear Cree, Nakoda, uh, Bush Dene, uh, Bush Cree, and Chippewan every single day, and, and Radio Bingo, I'm telling you, uh, Raven FM is, is the place to be. And, uh, and read books by Billy Ray Belcourt, Lisa Bird Wilson, Tyler Pentecock, and our dear friend who couldn't make it tonight, Mr. Joshua Whitehead. Musty Cho, read Indigenous because it's our time to tell our own stories our own way. Musty Cho, thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. Bless you all. See ya. Thank you so much to our panelists for your insights and thoughtful conversations about the power of storytelling. It was such a generous and incredible conversation and an absolute joy to listen to. And thank you to everybody who is tuning in from home. If you'd like to purchase the books featured in today's panels, please visit our official bookseller for this event, Another Story Bookshop, or our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, Rakuten Kobo. You have 10 more days to sign up for a giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. You can visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021 festival contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we will announce one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is CONNECT. Make sure to tune in later tonight when we will be joined by Liz Howard at 8.30 p.m. to discuss her book, Letters in a Bruised Cosmos, with Sarah Yimei Tsiang. And you can catch Lisa Bird Wilson with us again, hosting our conversation with Eden Robinson next Saturday at 7 p.m. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, you can visit our website at toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. If you would like to support the Word on the Street by making a donation, you can simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening.